and welcome to this training on proposal writing organized by uh, Hub Brussels, the host organization of NCP Brussels, in collaboration with APRE in the framework of Bridge to Horizon Europe. So Bridge to Horizon Europe is a coordination and support action funded by the European Commission under Horizon 2020. And this is to facilitate the transition from Horizon 2020 to Horizon Europe through transnational cooperation between the NCP support structures. It's built on NCP Academy and the other previous NCP network projects. And this project is coordinated by the Ministry of Science, Innovation and Universities in Spain. And it gathers 22 NCP host organizations across Europe under the leadership of the NCP coordinators. So the project started in November last year and is now expected to be extended uh, to the end of October 2022. We have uh, an amendment in preparation. So you may have already benefited from workshops, training activities, or other tools and services for NCPs and um, brokerage events that were developed for the continuous improvement of the NCP system. And besides these activities, the project has developed a common portal uh, complementing the, the official funding and tender opportunities portal where you can find useful tools and services developed by NCPs for NCPs. So both the portal uh, and the newly open virtual campus will be widely disseminated as of tomorrow. So they are part of the legacy of this project within the NCP community and both these platforms will be operational for the whole duration of the program. So for this training, we've developed an agenda over two days, uh, two afternoons actually, today and tomorrow. And my uh, colleague from NCP Brussels, Cardolin uh, Kala, who is NCP for Cultural Creativity and Inclusive Society, uh, and civil security for society uh, from NCP Brussels, as I am. So we'll uh, we'll have the pleasure to moderate uh, the event together today. So hello, Cardolin. Uh, Hi again. Yes. What can we say about the participation today? Well, we actually have uh, over uh, uh, 400 registrations. 421 was the last count. Uh, from more or less 46 countries, so, so it's a very diverse group. And um, I'm pleased to say that 137 of those registrations are from widening countries and 94 from non-EU countries. So we really, we're really reaching a, a, a very diverse wide range of people here. Uh, and that, that also includes their experience levels because uh, 99 of our participants today are nominated NCPs with less than one year of experience and a 88 of them are less than one year, have less than one year of experience and are going to be nominated uh, soon in the future, so not yet. And then uh, we have 233 uh, NCP participants who have more than one year of experience and are have been nominated and uh, 154 of them uh, with more than one year of experience that are going to be uh, nominated. And we have 62 NCP participants who have more than 10 years of experience. So as you can see from a couple of months to over 10 years, we have quite a wide range of people and 32 uh, nominated NCP coordinators. So we are addressing uh, a lot of people across a wide range of, wide range of experiences and uh, geographical uh, positions. Yeah, that's great to see that huh? we are going uh, to start soon. So we hope to grasp from this training uh, new ways to, to better advise our future applicants to Horizon Europe on proposal writing. Uh, um, and so we've uh, we've foreseen a coffee break uh, at 4 p.m. and two uh, Q&A sessions over this afternoon. So there will be two before and two after the break, two sessions. Uh, and we will use Slido to manage, to manage them. So you can already join uh, at Slido with the code that is mentioned here. So 542846, uh, and it will be the same uh, link for both days. So, and as we'll address in priority the most frequently asked 
or upvoted ones. So uh, we really recommend you to to uh, use the upvoting functionality of Slido. So and also just the last word at the end of the workshop, we'll kindly ask you to give us your feedback using the specific form. It's very helpful for us just to 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 have it and just to, it really contributes to the uh, continuous improvement of our uh, our activities. So I'm now very happy to uh, to start and uh, to introduce Julien Guerrier. So Julien Guerrier has been working for more than 25 years at the European Commission, mainly on industrial and research policy, international trade negotiations and corporate management issues. He's currently the director of the Common Policy Center for Horizon Europe. Previously, he was heading the EASM agency, the European Agency for Small and Medium-Sized Enterprises, which was managing the COSME program and, um, among others, the, the pilot of the EIC. So, Julien, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I would like first to thank you and thank all the organizers for inviting me to this event. It's, uh, it's an important day. Uh, the project that you are managing, the EU-funded uh, Bridge to Horizon Europe project, is playing a very important role in our opinion because it is leading the integration of the NCP systems into a coherent framework for Horizon Europe. Uh, this project will hopefully facilitate the continuity between Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe for the NCP structures and for the network coordination under a common portal, uh, the so-called Horizon Europe NCP portal. It's also a project which uh, has um, a multiplying training um, effect, capitalizing on the work of the previous NCP academies. Uh, it includes support to the new uh, NCPs and in particular on the new rules and procedures. Uh, it will help some sectoral activities at the start of Horizon Europe and it includes supporting Transfrontier broker brokerage events. So we count on you uh, to be successful on all these fronts. Uh, and what I would like to, to underline is that we, we have, of course, a long history of European framework programs for research and innovation. Uh, they've been successful, uh, increasingly well-funded over time, which is also a sign of their success and of the perceived impact that they've had on our research and innovation um, uh, efforts uh, in, uh, in Europe. They have impacted our economy, uh, job creation, our daily lives, but they have also been uh, successful in being agile and addressing unforeseen events. Uh, of course, I'm thinking of COVID. Last year, in 2020, Horizon 2020 was uh, flexible enough uh, uh, to redirect 1 billion euro uh, for the funding, emergency funding of research and innovation uh, in, uh, in COVID-related um, areas. Uh, and that has uh, produced um, uh, enormous um, uh, results. Now we are launching Horizon Europe, uh, the new program, and uh, we uh, want it to be even more impact oriented than its predecessors. What we see is that all the challenges that um, we, we knew we had, um, the green transformation, uh, the digital transition, um, uh, the, the cohesion uh, of our continent, all of that uh, has been uh, aggravated by uh, the COVID crisis. Uh, and we are uh, now um, uh, intending to use Horizon Europe as a key instrument to help us uh, deliver and contribute on our green and digital objectives in particular, but also on the resilience of Europe that we want to, to see, the new Europe we want to build after the, the crisis. In practice, this reinforced uh, impact orientation is translated at the programmation stage through the strategic plan, and I'll come back to it in a minute, and at the monitoring and evaluation stage through a new framework uh, that we call the key impact pathways. So let me first start with uh, the strategic plan and the programmation stage. What we have in Horizon Europe for the first time 
is a plan, a strategic plan, identifying strategic orientations for the first half of Horizon Europe, for the first four years. This strategic plan comes uh, and, and starts from the overarching priorities of the EU, the green and digital transitions, resilience to the crisis, and translates them into strategic orientations for the program in order for Horizon Europe to contribute to the maximum extent possible to the achievement of the obje objectives under this overarching uh, priorities that are green digital resilience. Uh, and then those four strategic orientations are translated into expected impacts for the work programs. And that is what is guiding our programmation. And the first work program 21-22 is built on the basis of these expected impacts stemming from the key strategic orientations of the strategic plan. In the strategic plan, the four key strategic orientations we have identified concern for the first one, the establishment and creation of a Europe that is strategically autonomous, uh, while of course preserving its open economy. And for that, we need to invest in research and innovation in key digital enabling and emerging technologies, in value chains and sectors that will enable us to accelerate and steer the digital and green transitions uh, through technologies that are human-centered and through innovations. The second key strategic orientation is to restore Europe's ecosystems and biodiversity. We want to be able, through research and innovation, to identify how to better manage our natural resources, how to ensure food security and at the same time a clean and healthy environment. The third strategic orientation is to create in Europe the first digitally enabled circular economy, a circular economy that is climate neutral and sustainable. And for this to happen, we need to transform uh, mobility, energy, construction and production systems. And that's only possible if we uh, invest in research and innovation and in breakthrough technologies in these areas. And finally, the, th the fourth um, uh, key strategic orientation is uh, to have a more resilient, inclusive and democratic European society. Again, uh, able uh, on the basis of research and innovation uh, to have the tools that will uh, prepare Europe better uh, to respond to threats, disasters, address inequalities and provide high quality health care. Uh, in, um, uh, in, in our new uh, uh, green and digital Europe. So for all these points, um, they were identified because we thought research and innovation would play there a pivotal, uh, pivotal role in uh, developing the solutions for these transformations to, to take place. The first work program, 21-22 of Horizon Europe, is built on those uh, strategic orientations. Uh, it is investing, as required by the legislation, a minimum of 35% of its budget into making Europe uh, for, uh, the first climate neutral continent by 2050. Uh, and it is very much focused on the green and digital transitions for our societies and the sustainable recovery from the current crisis. We will um, uh, focus on uh, areas uh, that will um, uh, support the transition towards clean energy, sustainable mobility, adapting food systems, supporting the circular and bioeconomy. Uh, so that's for the green side, I would say, uh, but also on the digital side, uh, lay the ground for new digital enterprises uh, to invest in the future and develop uh, uh, new, uh, new products, services and innovations. Uh, invest in uh, digital tools and data enabled uh, research and innovation in a wide range of sectors, including healthcare, media, energy, mobility. And um, uh, resilience, which is the, the third uh, big um, uh, priority, uh, will uh, be addressed through research and innovation uh, that will be uh, focused on repairing the immediate economic and social damage uh, brought about by the crisis uh, and investing in a new, greener, more digital, more resilient uh, Europe, better fit for the uh, challenges of the future. That includes vaccine development, 
health data space, um, supporting a new pandemic preparedness partnership, and investing in the new uh, activities of the HERA authority uh, that has been announced uh, yesterday by um, uh, President von der Leyen in her uh, State of the Union speech. To um, achieve all that, we will need good proposals uh, from our research and innovation community, and that's where we count on you to support them uh, to, to, to make those, uh, those proposals. Uh, that's for the programmation side, for you to have the context. Now, on the monitoring and evaluation side, we need to change our approach to better capture impact and capture it also faster. Uh, there is a, a delay, of course, in research and innovation between the time we invest, we research, we innovate, uh, and the time we see the actual uh, results and impacts on the ground of those innovations and research results. So we have um, developed a new set of indicators called the key impact pathways that aim at capturing impact not only a posteriori, but, at, uh, but also during the course of the project um, management. Uh, this is going to be important for us to better uh, adjust uh, and adapt our work programs, our framework program in the next few years uh, in order to uh, improve its, um, its impact over, over time and address the emerging challenges that we see. Uh, the practical implications of this new framework for the projects is that uh, for each proposal, we will expect uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the people behind the proposals to develop their own pathway towards impact, their own impact story or narrative, if you want. And that will enable them to show how they see uh, their contribution to the work program uh, and how uh, they see um, their impact logic uh, being um, uh, rolled out uh, along um, the progress of their project. We uh, will leave them basically a lot of freedom uh, to explain how they want to conduct their research by um, uh, having a focus in the calls for proposals on the objectives, on the expected impacts that we want to see. Uh, but we will expect from them to give us a clear and logical structure uh, to um, uh, to, to, to their projects and their key impact pathways so that uh, they are able to communicate uh, a story on their project and we can consolidate all of that uh, into a narrative on Horizon Europe where indicators will enable us to attribute uh, the results uh, to the um, uh, efforts of uh, the projects. Uh, this um, uh, will, um, uh, of course, uh, be, be partly new for the, for, for, for the beneficiaries or the applicants. Uh, and here also, your role will be important to support them in developing their impact uh, pathway. My colleagues will tell you more about the practical implementation of this approach uh, later on. Let me conclude, perhaps, as you've understood throughout my intervention, how much we are grateful for the great work we, you, you have done, NCPs, uh, along the years and the previous framework programs and how much we count on you uh, to support uh, further the applicants, the beneficiaries, in order to make sure that uh, we can optimize the impact of the program and get the best possible proposals for our calls. Uh, you are unique in that um, you have uh, a network across uh, the territory of the European Union and the associated countries, and you can provide information and on-the-ground advice to potential applicants and beneficiaries in their language throughout the project lifecycle in a manner that would be impossible for us to do from Brussels or for uh, our agencies uh, acting uh, alone. So uh, we want to join forces with you and we will be there to support you in your work in the next uh, seven years. I count on all of you to make Horizon Europe a resounding success uh, in the vein of its predecessors. Thanks a lot for your attention. 
Thank you very much, uh, Julien. Always a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you very much for your presentation. And I, I think you won't be able to stay for um, questions and answers, unfortunately. So we'll thank you here. My colleagues will be here, so don't hesitate. Uh, and, and of course, I'm reachable uh, uh, bilaterally or, or through you uh, for any questions you, you may have. OK, thank you very much for, for coming and for your time. And uh, just uh, just a little reminder to our um, to our participants, maybe in this question of uh, answer session, if you keep the questions related to impact, I think we will be uh, uh, it will be more beneficial uh, for for everyone for this part of the the training. Excuse me. So uh, next up, I would like to invite uh, Angelica Marino, who's a policy analyst at the Common Program Analysis and Regulatory Reform Unit at uh, DGRTD uh, of the Commission, and she works on analyzing and monitoring the impact of the research and innovation framework programs, and uh, she's here now to, to explain to us further um, the key impacts pathway and policy aspects. So, hello Angelica, thank you. Hello, hi. Um, can you see my presentation? Yes, we can okay. see it in, in full mode, so the floor is yours. Okay. OK, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so yes, hello, everybody. And thank you, Julianne, uh, for, for this great uh, introduction and for, well, preparing the floor <laughs> for me. Uh, so I, uh, I work in the, in the monitoring and evaluation unit of the Directorate uh, in the General uh, Research and Innovation. And yes, I will present the impact in Horizon, Euro in Horizon Europe and specifically more the project applications. Um, so both in that sense, uh, uh, um, the, the, the impact logic and, and what this mean, why are we measuring this? And as uh, so, but also what this means for project, what is the impact on projects? And also, why we need to, why, what is the importance, why is it so important for research and innovation? Well, research and innovation are a key part of uh, EU response uh, to today's challenges, as explained by, uh, by Julien. Uh, so be it part of the pandemic, or the European downturn, the climate change, the digital uh, transition. And uh, more than ever, we are being part to direct uh, research and innovation towards these challenges and to better understand uh, the impact that uh, our, our investments and uh, our research and innovation have towards uh, moving towards these challenges and the commitments that we are making. Uh, so this is why we have invested in a new uh, impact logic for the framework program and the key impact uh, uh, pathways. Um, yes, so um, I will first explain um, uh, a bit, yes, the, the monitoring framework. So what does this mean at the framework level, which is the key impact pathways? Uh, this is what we, we, we mean when we talk about the key impact pathways. And then at the, for project, at project level, what this means is the, is the project pathways to, to impact, which might also explain a bit uh, some confusion here. Uh, the key impact pathways is at a higher level, what we explain about the key impact pathways, which means, okay, what are the pathways to certain impacts? And when we talk about the project pathways to impact, it's really more concretely about the projects, how, what are the projects way of, of yeah, the storyline that Julian was speaking about, the storyline, what are projects ways of reaching these certain impacts, uh, which I will be uh, talking more about during this uh, presentation. Uh, so, um, as you see, this is all part of, uh, of the policy cycle and the adaptation of, uh, of uh, 
the framework program uh, and it's redesigned towards a more impact driven um, framework program, uh, which is still, um, I would say, a work in progress. And it's still a part of a, of a feedback loop with a new intervention logic and the program structuring. And, uh, and, um, and it's, uh, it's something that is being worked out through the, both the, the application form, the work program, uh, also there the reporting, uh, and also the, the monitoring program, obviously, the project selection, the interim and Xbox evaluation. So it's, um, it's something that it's still work in progress also to be um, uh, consistent and to be able to collect all the necessary data that we need, but also to be able to, of course, to use, uh, uh, use the data that we have and to be able to, to, be able to, to, uh, to achieve uh, uh, what we want to achieve and, and to be able to, uh, to, to have a result-oriented investments and research and innovation going forward. And this uh, shows a bit uh, on a high level uh, the impact design um, of the project, uh, of the program, sorry, uh, at the legislative level, because this comes from directly from the, from the legal base. But of course, um, all projects, uh, especially well, scientific projects, have uh, different goals, uh, problems, results, and milestones. And uh, we all know that research and innovation is inherently uncertain and impacts a core uh, many times at a very after a very long time and it, it might the, the impact might also occur not maybe uh, at the project level, but it might also be displaced in that sense. Uh, so there's uh, a lot of diversity and uncertainty. Um, so this is why uh, the impact in this type of project cannot be calculated as simply as it might be for other type of projects, which is why we came up with these pathways to projects to, uh, to, to be able to take into account uh, these different sort of elements of uncertainty, uncertainty and, and time delay as well. Um, and also um, the multitude, let, let's say, of different uh, dimensions. And uh, the main sort of streams here uh, that we are, are trying to, to account for are these three streams. So scientific impacts, societal impact that also include uh, uh, environmental impact and economic impact that include also uh, more technology impacts. Uh, and under all these streams include about, uh, about 30 uh, additional sort of sub uh, key impact pathways. Um, that are further uh, specified in the in the work program, which I will explain uh, further in during the uh, during the presentation. Um, and they are also specified in for short, medium, and uh, long term impact. And here, of course, it's it's difficult to specify what is sh short, long, and uh, short medium and long-term impact because it, it depends very much on the project and, and on the type of, of impact. But as a sort of very, very, very general uh, uh, reference, uh, I guess we could say something like one, three and five years could be short, medium and, and long-term, where, where uh, um, short-term is something that is quite, you can quite easily see a direct outcome and medium term it could be something where it's really it might be at the end of the project and long term it might be um, sometimes after the end of the project so where it's more difficult to relate it directly it's direct it's directly related to the project but it's not at the end of the project it might come a bit after the project but it's it's a 
that, that would be more of a long term project, more long term impact. And we have also um, developed some observable indicators also here that are related to these uh, uh, key impact pathways and also our key impact pathways narrative. So as Julien mentioned, we want to leave uh, projects to develop this uh, storyline where they can really uh, develop themselves and, and look, okay, what is this project, this uh, innovation really contributing to, to? What is the impact? And then we give them the means to use these indicators, these key impact pathways, um, to, and, uh, uh, to, to make it a bit more sort of easy and, and also to, um, to be able, to, of course, to, uh, to make it uh, consistent with the other projects so that we can measure it in a consistent manner uh, and, to, and to link it to these more long-term key impact pathways. Uh, so this is a bit uh, the, the logic of the of the impact design of the program and uh, and um, and the impact logic. And here um, I will give you one uh, as one as uh, one uh, example of an uh, one uh, one key impact pathway. So. Uh, impact pathway number seven, so economic uh, generating innovation-based uh, growth. Just to give you an example of uh, how this, uh, this works a bit more in practice. Um, so you see here, so generating uh, economic pathway seven, generating innovation-based growth. Um, here, for example, in the in the legislation, uh, we have uh, the story like the quote: uh, uh, "Horizon Europe generation innovation-based growth," um, shown by its microeconomic effects on supported companies and its macro uh, macroeconomic effects on Europe's economy. Uh, so this is uh, this is something that is uh, the storyline, and here, for example, uh, the the company, the company can, for example, uh, look at okay, uh, it is okay. This is something that we think that we can we can relate to. This is something that relates to the type of the type of impact that uh, that that our uh, project has. So that doesn't mean that they should reproduce exactly what is in the in the legislation, what is in the work program, but it means that, okay, it's something that they can relate to. So, for example, uh, here they, they should they should relate to this economic pathway number seven and they they should describe the short medium long term impact that they are expecting so for example they they should then describe okay uh, well my colleagues i think will go more into details with this but then they should describe okay what are the expected quantifiable and measurable, uh, let's say, expected outcome at the short, long, medium and term uh, that they are expecting. So this is the type then of, of impact that they would be expecting. But it's all about here relating it to uh, this economic pathway, uh, but relating it really an, a narrative. And then, of course, explaining, OK, what would be the limitations? What would be the barriers? Why is Buddhist? What would be also there the the factors contributing to to this success and so on? So really making it a storyline, building building a robust storyline around around it to give it some some poison, some uh, uh, yeah to to, to 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 build it a, a robust story uh, and to give it some um, um, credibility in that sense of of why it's it's uh, it's, it's a credible uh, expectation, although we don't know what will happen in the future, but why is it expected that there's a, a possibility of this to happen? And uh, 
going more into detail and explaining a bit more how the strategic plan relates to the work program here. Uh, you can see that uh, um, that the legal base is this impact driven program framework program that uh, that I explained earlier. The strategic plan it gives these EU priorities and the strategic orientation for R and I uh, that are these uh, uh, key impact pathways in this um, key uh, strategic orientations that are a bit more let's say that goes more into details, but also uh, they they go into expected impacts, uh, which are also um, included in the work program. Uh, as you will see in the work program, under each cluster, you have expected impacts and you also have the expected outcomes, which are in the topics. And these give clear indications of what, are ex what is expected uh from from our side in that sense of uh, in in the terms of results and um, and outcomes so these are the let's let's say different levels of uh, key impact pathways uh, of impacts that you can say that are expected on this different level where of course on the legal base, the key impact pathways is the highest level. Then you have more the pathways to impacts, that is the more lower level. But uh, but as was mentioned in the title of my presentation, what is expected from 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 uh, from projects, it's it's here in the work program, as you can see in this presentation. It's in the expected impacts, which is in the destinations of the work program and the expected outcomes are in the topic. So this gives a clear uh, message to the projects of what are the expected impacts that, uh, that we are expecting, expecting projects within the work program and especially within a specific cluster um, to have or to reach with their projects. Yes, and um, the, this next slide goes further into yeah, the specific objectives of the topics and the operational objectives, which is a even lower level. So the short term outputs created during the project implementation, which I think my, my colleagues will go further into, uh, into discussing, uh, which is more related to the results uh, of the of the project itself. Um, but yeah, I think that um, this is the main. Yeah, I think this is the main. I think differentiation between um, uh, the most important thing for for uh, for uh, applicants to understand. So it, it's it's really this um, this um, relationship between the the higher level key impact pathways at the strategic level and how it relates to the expected impacts and how it's important for them to build the storyline and then the relationship between the results, outcome and impact and how to really build a robust storyline on how they relate. Um, and, and here it's important, of course, not to not to copy what is in the strategic plan or the work program, but, but to really uh, be able to explain um, how uh, how their project can contribute in a in a significant and um, 
and uh, significant in the sense of in the sense of what type of percentage of the of the market or or uh, how it's uh, so so in the sense of, of what what type of difference would it be making at um, um, on a market level or to um, yeah to, to the to the to on an environmental level or so on uh, so what type of market effect it would be having and also to to for example to explain. Uh, uh, any potential uh, uh, negative environmental outcome or impacts and uh, uh, potential barriers, to market par barriers and mitigating measures uh, that uh, that might be necessary. And whenever possible, always to quantify the estimation, uh, the estim estimations that are being done when. Um, when calculations are being made, uh, especially uh, relating to the results and the and the outcome, of course, the impact is is further in the future, so it's it's a bit more difficult there uh, relating to the estimation. But um, relating to estimations for the outcome, it's very important always there to uh, to uh, uh, that uh, that any assumptions or estimations that they, they are though uh, those are uh, are explained and also there uh, the baselines and benchmarks and uh, methodologies are are consistently used and um, and also they're explained uh, properly um in order for um for for the outcome and impact to be be really be able to be taken seriously, and I then I think that the impact criterion be will be further discussed by uh, by my one of my colleagues. So I don't think that I will go a bit further into uh, discussing that any further. But it's uh, it's also important here that the the impact catch criterion is also. Um, well, it's important to know that the impact criterion then relates to these, let's say, three uh, uh, indicators to results and uh, contributions to outcome and contributions to expected impact. Um, so, yes, I think this was all for me uh, now, uh, but uh, uh, I am available for any question. If if you have any questions. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you, Angelica. And so there, there are a um, couple of questions in on Slido. Um, so that are related to, to impacts. And these ones will be addressed in priority because we are not here just to uh, comment all the parts of the proposal template. But um, I will go with the first one, the most important one, actually, about the, the impact canvas. So someone is asking if it's a mandatory or voluntary uh, requirements in the proposal template, actually. It, it's uh, obligatory, yes. It is obligatory. Uh, uh, maybe, yeah, Angelica, I, if yes. I can compliment. Yes, yes. <laughs> like, it's not officially mandatory because none of the part of the of the proposal template is what we would say mandatory except the requirement to have a dissemination and exploitation exploitation plan because this is an eligibility criteria what we say is that um, you have this, uh, applicants who have this uh, this proposal template. They are of course free not to fill, for example, this canvas. We will not reject the proposal. We will not say it is not eligible and not evaluated because there is not this canvas. Of course not. But applicants need to to keep in mind that uh, of course they will be assessed among other proposals that will probably have filled in this canvas. So we would say that it's wiser to to fill in because it's really helping the experts to perform the evaluation, and it's we also believe that it helps the applicants to structure the impact section of their proposals. 
but if it is not there, we will not reject immediately the proposals. That's uh, what I could say from my side. Thank you, Benedict. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, then we have another uh, question that is quite popular on, on impact. Uh, Angelica, it's uh, any advice on how to divide open science practices between the excellence chapter in methodology and the impact chapter in uh, communication and dissemination? So I'm, I'm not understanding. Uh, uh, so the, the question is asking for if, if you have any advice on um, how to where to put uh, open science practices between the methodology section and the excellence chapter or the communication and dissemination and impact. I don't know if that makes more sense. Um, I, I am not really understanding the question in the sense of uh, open because they are. Uh, I think they're asking yeah. for your uh, opinion on how to where to put open science practices in, in a proposal in, in a methodology for excellence or in communication dissemination as an impact. Uh, well, well uh, because uh, I mean, open science, uh, I mean, if it's open science, normal open science for, for me, to, to me, it, it seems like it goes to, to dissemination. But uh, here also, Benedict, may, maybe you, you can uh, co correct me. Maybe yes, I can so, yeah. just complement from the proposal yeah. template uh, perspective. Yes. So now in Horizon Europe, and this is one of the novelty, open science practices and, research and management of research data are part of the excellence criterion. So it's um, it will be evaluated under this excellence criterion. And of course, uh, applicants will have to describe them in this uh, section of the proposal template related to excellence to the methodology. But of course, uh, and as Angelica said, uh, open science practices also have a link with the dissemination because if among your open science practices you have something like, I don't know, addressing the scientific community or addressing uh, some citizens for some participatory actions, this is also part of your dissemination and exploitation. But what would probably be expected in there is something at the more general scale under excellence, how those open science practices are part of your methodology. And in your draft dissemination and exploitation plan, you could have really concrete measures, which targets you are aiming to, to reach with your measures and which nature of the, which kind of events or these kind of things could be more part of the dissemination and exploitation section. I don't know if it's yeah. clarifying or, or not yeah, too much. So it depends what type of activities it is, if it's part of your method methodology in that sense, so the, the methodology part in that sense should be part of the ex excellence, yeah, so it's, yeah. Yes, thank you, and, and a very short question, so about the short term, short -term impact, so yes. you said after one year, three year, and five years, so is it meant to be one year after the project has started, or one year after the project has ended. So, so yes, one year after the project has started, but but this is really indicative. It's, it's really uh, just uh, indicative. It, uh, like I mentioned, it depends really uh, on the on the project, on the impact, and so on. It's really just in order to give uh, some kind of reference, in order not to be too vague. So it really depends on the type of impact and, and project, yes. But it's from, it's from the start of the project. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have another question uh, about impact that says, mm -hmm. to what extent should proposals attempt to address destination level impacts? Uh, and, and the person says, as there is a limited space in the proposal, to what extent should, be, should we address the destination level impacts? Well, um, um, so the destination level, well, the, the destination impacts are the ones that are relevant for a specific cluster, obviously. And, um, and I mean, they are in, for some clusters, there are several uh, destinations, there are several impacts, for some, they are less. 
And I don't think the aim is to reach as many impacts or as many destinations as possible in that sense. That is not the aim. It's more like a, a, a direction. Um, and it's really... Um, um, uh, in this, it's really a, a, a direction, and in, in the sense, it's. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think that it should. Um, if it's relevant for a project, then they 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 can say link to it, but they don't need to link to it if it's not relevant. So, in the sense, uh, um. I, I doubt that it will be an issue of of space because for because they cannot uh, link to so many <laughs> so many destinations. Uh, I mean, with it being significant linkage, in that sense, and in that case, they would need to to identify which would be the most significant impact that are relevant for their projects. They will need to choose if they are, if all the destinations within a specific cluster are relevant, then they would need to prioritize the most relevant destinations. And then there also also depends on the topic they're applying for, obviously, because uh, some some topics are on their specific destinations as well. Yeah. So thank you for clarifying this. Uh, mm -hmm. and another question uh, that is asked. Uh, in, in the chapter 2.3 of the proposal, I don't know if you know by heart the structure of the proposal. Unfortunately it, not. <laughs> yeah, the question is about the, the sequence uh, of impact. So, uh, can can this sequence be changed? That's the sense of the question. Oh. On the impact <laughs> canvas, the one you were talking about. Okay. Maybe that will be again a bit more for me because it's really yeah. about the proposal template. And here my answer will be a bit the same as the the one about whether it is mandatory or not. Of course, applicants uh, are free to to present the things the way they want and the way it makes more sense for their specific proposal. Uh, of course, for the evaluators, if they have uh, a bunch of proposals to evaluate. It's always easier if everybody uses Canvas in the same way because for them, they well, they will navigate more easily through through the through the proposal. So here again, applicants are free, but they need to keep in mind that they will be assessed against proposals that uh, might have uh, used the structure proposed by the by the commission in the application form. It's a bit the, the same type of answer. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so there was another question that um, that I thought was interesting to ask. So, uh, someone says, if the long term impact vision of a project goes up to 30 years, would this be a wrong approach? Uh, absolutely, absolutely not. I think this is. Uh, do, do you hear me? Yeah, absolutely not. I mean, this is uh, that that's why I mean, uh, we are a bit reluctant to say, okay, it's uh, it's five years, it's a long term, long term impact because it's difficult to say. I mean, in theory, long term impact is is twenty thirty years, uh, so it's uh, it's in order maybe not to disencourage people that we say twenty five years, but it goes from five to yeah twenty thirty years. But yes, uh, long term impact is is 20 30 yes so no that that is not incorrect absolutely not yeah. okay thank you um angelica i think there are questions that are very relating to far more relating to the um the presentation that uh Benedict is going to to give in a few moments, so maybe I could I suggest to keep these ones for after the presentation, and probably they will be answered during the presentation of Benedict. So um, I suggest just to to give a chance to everyone just to hear the full presentation of Benedict, and then uh, go through the the different questions and try to to address. Again, the most relevant ones, those that, that are directly linked to the subject of today. So the the impact on the horizon Europe. Good. Yes. Yeah, thank you. So uh, thank you very much, Angelica. Thank you. Bye. So now uh, 
I'm happy to introduce Benedict Charbonnel, uh, who is policy officer in the Common Services for Business Process of the Directorate Research and Innovation at the European Commission. And uh, she works, among others, on the issues related to uh, submission and evaluation of proposals. So thank you, Benedict, already for your um, answers in the previous session, but now the floor is yours for your presentation. Thank you very much. And let me just uh, do the technical operation of sharing my screen. I will try not to mix up these different screens. Uh, okay, and I will just change the settings. Okay, so now you should see uh, the proper the proper slides in the proper space and proper size. Yes, so indeed. indeed, I'm working in GRTD in a service that is called Common Service for Business Processes. That sounds really complicated, but actually, uh, we are uh, working on all the processes of how things work. And here, we will, I'm focusing most specifically on submission and evaluation issues. So for Horizon Europe, my unit has worked in collaboration with a lot of different commission services to define how we are going to evaluate uh, proposals under Horizon Europe. So we have uh, not, uh, notably uh, worked a lot on the application form for Horizon Europe. And this is what I'm going to to present to you today. So first, um, we are going to focus on submission because it's where everything starts. And most likely, uh, majority of you already knows a lot of what I'm uh, I'm going to say. Uh, all this information that I'm going to present to you now about admissibility, eligibility, evaluation criteria, all of, most of this information are available in what we call the general annexes to the work program. This is a document that is really uh, well important for for you to to know, but I'm pretty sure you know it already, and to advise um, applicants to to have a look at. It is available, of course, in the funding and tenders portal in the um, tab about support and in the reference document uh, categories. And it's really here that you will have all the information that is worth to, to know and to make, uh, to make applicants aware of. So let's start from the, from the beginning, admissibility issues. Um, how are we uh, going to, um, to know that a proposal that has been submitted is admissible or not. This has not changed much uh, from Horizon 2020, so a lot of you will already be familiar with the fact that uh, applications uh, need to be submitted before the call deadline, that's pretty obvious, and electronically uh, using the funding and tenders portal. Of course, the applications must be complete, readable, accessible and printable. And they must include a plan or draft plan for the dissemination and exploitation of results. This is an, an admissibility criteria, meaning that if a proposal doesn't have this draft plan, it will be not admissible and not even evaluated. Of course, there are exceptions and it might be possible that in some topics it is written in the call conditions that for this specific topic, the dis dissemination and exploitation plan is not needed. But this is similar to Horizon 2020, so that's well pretty standard. Like uh, under Horizon 2020, uh, we have standard uh, page limit for the, for the proposals. And here uh, we implemented some changes under Horizon Europe because um, there is a substantial reduction of the number of pages that are, uh, are allowed. So for research and innovation and inno actions and innovation actions, we are now uh, um, setting up the, the maximum of uh, pages authorized to 45. For coordination and support actions, it is 30. Of course, here again, there are sometimes some exceptions. So this is a general rule, but it may happen, might happen that for some topics, the topic description in the work program is saying uh, something else. And here I'm thinking notably about cluster five. I'm sure that among you uh, are some uh, some persons that are uh, working with cluster five. And here you may know that, for example, for a number of topics, they allow to have 70 pages for uh, research and innovation actions, for example. 
So the r main rule is 45 pages, 30 pages, but be aware that there might be exception. For first stage uh, proposal, the limit is 10 pages. And then for the other type of action, I, I invite you to, to have a look at the, if you're interested at the, what is said in the, in the work program. So once um, a proposal I've been, well, what I've done. So the admissibility is at the first step. Uh, when a proposal is submitted, this will be assessed by the EU staff. And if the proposal is not admissible, it will be rejected at that time. Otherwise, it will pro, uh, go to the next step, which is the question of eligibility. This is also something that will be checked by EU staff. And here, um, what is important to, to have in mind is that any legal entity established even in a non-associated uh, third countries, so not an EU member state, not an associated country, is eligible to participate unless the wording of the topics are uh, excluded. Uh, you may have noticed that it's not really frequent, but from some specific topics, and the, the work program can say that for this topic, the participation is uh, only for EU member states or for EU member state and associated countries or for EU member states and a list of given countries. This is when there is a specific issues in implying the, um, the preservation of the European in Union interests and um, and security. This is for some topics, mainly in cluster four, a bit elsewhere, but otherwise the general rule is that an illegal entity can participate. Then we have the question of the consortium composition. So for the collaborative projects uh, that are research and innovation action or innovation action, you have the rules here. One independent legal entity established and in a member sense and at least two other uh, legal entities either in a different member state or an associated country are required so that the, the consortium is eligible. For the CSA project, it's one or more legal entities established in a member state or in an associated country and in exceptional cases, if it is uh, specified in the, in the topic description, in another third country. Something else uh, regarding the eligibility, and this is a novelty uh, of Horizon Europe, is that for all the calls that have a deadline uh, from 2022 on, the participants that are public bodies, research organizations or higher education establishments must have a gender equality plan that is covering a minimum, um, some minimum requirements. So this means that at the proposal stage, there is a box, a tick box, and each organization will have to tick that indeed they have a um, gender equality plan. I will not enter too much in the details of the gender equality plan now, because I know that tomorrow you will have a session with Anne Pépin, who is working in the gender unit in the in DGRTD and she will be able to clarify for you what is a gender equality plan and what are those um, minimum requirements that it should cover. So I leave it uh, for her as she's really the, the expert on the question. We have mentioned the eligibility of the participation, the, how the consortium uh, needs to be set up. Now, a second question is the eligibility for funding, because I said that any kind of legal entity can participate, but not all legal entities can be funded. So by default, all EU member states and their outermost regions can be funded, and the same applies to the overseas countries and territories. When we uh, look at non-EU countries, those that are automatically eligible for funding are the associated countries to arise in Europe and the low and middle income countries. Where to find the list of all those countries? It is in a document, you have a link here in the, in the slide, which is called the Horizon Europe Program Guide. Probably a lot of you already uh, know about this document. It is also available on the Funding and Tenders portal in this Support uh, tab under the Reference document in the Guidance section. So here you have all the, the list of all the countries who are, which are the associated uh, countries to Horizon Europe or the to be associated countries and which are those low and middle income countries. Regarding the other countries, other third countries, 
they are eligible for funding when it is announced in the text of the of the call for proposal. It may happen that the call is open to participation of, I don't know, United States, let's say. So this time United States uh, leg, um, entities will be um, able to, to get funding. Or if um, the participation of an entity from one of these third countries is uh, assessed as essential. So this will be part of the evaluation. And the moment of the evaluation, the experts will look at uh, what will be the role of this entity from an not automatically eligible for funding entity. And if their participation is essential because they have uh, specific expertise that is not uh, possible to find elsewhere or specific equipment or access to whatever research infrastructure or this kind of things, they will say that this, yes, indeed, the participation of this entity is essential and this entity will get EU funding. Then you also have some specific cases. Um, the affiliated entities that are established in countries eligible for funding will be funded. Uh, same as for EU bodies. And regarding international uh, organization, the international European research organization are eligible for funding. And um, by default, the other international organizations are not eligible unless here again their participation is assessed as essential. I uh, talked already about the associated countries. So who are the associated countries uh, to Horizon Europe? As you're probably aware, the negotiation um, with the, the countries to be associated to the program are still ongoing. So for the time being, uh, the, the applicants that are established in a country that was associated to Horizon Europe or entities established in other third countries that are negotiating their association to rise on Europe would be treated as uh, entities established in an associated country. Uh, if, and this, well, uh, this is the, the important point, if the association agreement uh, will be signed and will apply at the time of the signature of the grant agreement. As I already said, you have the list of those associated countries or to be associated countries available in the Horizon Europe program guide. Then we have two specific situations. Uh, first, UK, which is expected to be uh, soon an, asso an associated country to Horizon Europe, which means that uh, the UK entities can take part in the first call of Horizon Europe. Uh, uh, with the exception of the EIC fund, fund which is a, is a part of the EIC with the loan equity instrument, and this UK will, uh, will not associate. Then we have the specific solution, uh, situation of Switzerland that was associated to Horizon 2020, but as you probably know, uh, for the moment, the, all the talks regarding the association of Switzerland uh, are on hold. So it means that in the meantime, Switzerland is not considered as a candidate associated country to arise on Europe, and it will be considered as a non-associated third country for the time being. Let's go now to activities eligible for funding. So what is uh, eligible for funding is what is described in the call conditions. And on top of that, we, you have here uh, four bullet points that um, are the, the four elements on which applications and activities should uh, not aim at. So it should not aim at uh, human cloning or intend to modify the genetic heritage of human beings, nor create human embryos only for the purpose of, uh, of research, or lead to the destruction of, um, of human embryos. Let's go now to the type of actions, it's already something I mentioned, but I will not enter too much in uh, in detail because I'm pretty sure that there is things that you know already and there is not that much change in comparison to Horizon 2020. So each uh, topic in our work program is belonging to one type of action and the most uh, common one for the collaborative projects are, and you probably know that already, the research and innovation action, the innovation action and the coordination and support action. And in this presentation, I'm focusing mostly on these three type of actions because it's really the, the most common collaborative uh, projects. Of course, we also have uh, other type of action. We have the, notably the ERC or the Marie Skodowska-Curie scheme that are really important as well. 
but that's not the main focus of this uh, of this presentation. Something also important to, to keep in mind, but this is uh, not novelty, it was already like that under Horizon 2020, is the funding rate. So for uh, research and innovation action and coordination and support action, the funding rate remains 100%. So the, the EU contribution will cover 100% of the of the activities to be implemented in the in the project. For innovation action, it's 70%, except for non-profit legal entities. And you have on the slide the race for the other type of action. Still keeping in mind that it might happen that in the specific call conditions, uh, different funding rates uh, will apply for a specific topic. Let's go now to uh, the application form. So the application form, or also called proposal template, uh, here the same logic applies as under Horizon 2020. This application form contains two parts. The part A, which is also called sometimes the administrative part of the, um, of the application form, is a web-based form. It is generated by the IT system. So participants will access the submission system uh, in the funding and tenders portal. They will identify the topic they are interested in, click on submit, and then they will have access to uh, this web-based form where they will be able to enter information about themselves. And then is the part B, which is called sometimes uh, technical part or narrative part of the proposal. And in this part B includes the three sections that correspond to the evaluation criterion of, uh, of Horizon Europe. I will come back a bit later to the, to the evaluation criterion. So as under Horizon 2020, the part B needs to be uploaded uh, as a PDF document and applicants have to use the templates that they can download in the submission system. It's important that the, the applicants use really uh, the template that they will download in the submission uh, system for the specific topic they are applying to because we have indeed um, standard templates that are published on the portal, but it might happen that for a specific topic, there are some small um, adjustments in the template. So it's always important to use the templates that applicants will download in the, in the system. Uh, something that has changed um, in Horizon 2020 is that in Horizon 2020, we add um, two parts of this part B. We had section one, two, three corresponding to um, the evaluation criteria and we had section four and five that were additional information, uh, for example, about ethics and security. This is no longer exists because it is now embedded in the part A of the application form. So now there is only one um, part B document to, to upload. And depending on the topic, it might happen that there is also specific annex to upload. For example, we have a specific annex uh, about clinical trials for, for topics for which uh, this is relevant, or sometimes we have specific annex when in the, in the project there will be financial support um, to third parties. This might happen, but it will be always explained in the, in the topics conditions. So the structure remains the same as under Horizon 2020, but of course we have uh, new features in the Horizon Europe application form. Uh, we have new fields in the part A in this administrative uh, form that is IT supported. We have something that is called the researchers table. Probably you, you saw it already and you might also have received already questions from applicants about this table because it's uh, it's a topic for a lot of questions. This table is a table where um, we ask uh, applicants to enter the researchers that will work on the project. And um, this table is used uh, only for monitoring purposes uh, on the side of the commission. You saw from Angelica presentation uh, earlier that um, Horizon Europe is what we call an impact driven program and we really want to be able to monitor which impact has Horizon Europe on different indicators and one of these indicators is the careers of the researchers. So we want to, to be able to assess if the fact that the researcher participated to an Horizon Europe proposal to help him um, to develop his career basically. So that's why we ask applicants to put the name of the researchers in this table they need only to put the name of researchers and only the name of the researchers that they know 
they will work on the um, project at the moment of the application. So no need to, to put that we will recruit someone. We only want to know the names of the researchers that are known at the moment of writing the proposal. And this is used for um, monitoring. So that's not a problem if a proposal has no researchers because it has no researchers. It's, uh, it's not going to impact the evaluation of this, um, of this proposal. And something important to know as well, it's not because we only want to have the information about researchers in these tables that we don't care about the other staff involved in the proposal and that we think that they are not important. That's not at all the, the message that the Commission wants to, to pass in there. Then you have a second table that is also used for monitoring purposes, which is a table about the role of participating organization. And you have also this novelty of the gender equality plan that I um, talked about already. Then we have fields that moved from the part B to the part A. This is those former section four and five of the application form under Horizon 2020. So there is the table for the ethics self-assessment that has been moved to part A. The new questionnaire about security, I will, mean, I will talk a bit more about it later in the presentation. And all the information on uh, participants' uh, previous activities related to the call and also information about the publication. I don't know why it's not in the, in the slide, but now in part A, there are fields to enter uh, previous projects uh, that were relevant for, for the action and the list of relevant publications. This is now in the part A. And of course, we have novelties in the part B of the proposal template. We added a glossary of terms. And uh, we made sure that we use the same wording, the same terminology in all project phases from the work program uh, writing to uh, proposals and report reporting. And something that we have developed is that we have uh, added way more explanations in the core of this proposal template about what exactly should be included under each section. And I will come back to, to that a bit more into detail in a minute. So basically, that's um, what needs to be to be done for the novelties regarding submission. And now we can go to what is uh, new in the evaluation process. So here I will address uh, the evaluation criteria and how um, how this criteria should be addressed in the in the proposals. So here again, um, we have a strong measure of continuity with Horizon 2020 because the uh, evaluation or award criteria are the same. Excellence, impact and quality and efficiency of the implementation. For the ERC, uh, there is only one evaluation criterion. Sorry, I made a typo on the slide, which is excellence. So the criteria remain the same, but still we have adapted them uh, following what we learned from Horizon 2020. And most, most importantly, what we have done is that we have reduced what we call the aspects to be taken into account, it, which is actually the su sub criteria, if you want. And we have made sure that we don't evaluate the same thing twice. We already mentioned that in the previous presentation, the open science practices, they are now assessed as a part of the scientific methodology under the excellence criteria. We have implemented a new approach to impact, and this is what uh, Angelica already uh, presented to you. Uh, Benedict, uh, I'm yeah. sorry to cut you off, but uh, you have five more minutes. Okay, um, I will try to rush. <laughs> I will try to rush. And uh, we have removed uh, what is about the management structures. It was something we were evaluated under the quality and efficiency of the implementation, but we realized that in most of the proposals, this was really good, that people know how to have a good management structure. So it doesn't mean that it's not important for a project, but it's not something we will use any longer to evaluate our proposals. So here are the evaluation criteria. If you have a careful look at the proposal template, the section B, you will see that uh, it's really mirroring this, uh, this criteria. So under excellence, we will ask applicants to describe their project objective, whether they are ambitious or not. And then we will ask them to describe uh, their methodology. And here um, they need to include, um, of course, the model concept assumption 
and so on and so forth, but also the gender dimension of the research and innovation content and the quality of open science practices. I will not enter in detail because uh, this will be addressed probably tomorrow with the with uh, for people that will focus their, their presentation on these elements. Then you have the impact criteria that we already discussed today. So applicants will be uh, asked to present their pathways to achieve the expected outcomes and impacts that are described in the work program. And here's something really important and a message that you, you should pass to applicants is that we don't want applicants to be super vague and try to address as much impact as possible. We want them really to be precise and to explain us what will be the contribution, the re really concrete contribution of their project to the outcomes and impacts of the work program. And then they will have uh, to present uh, the measures to maximize this expected outcomes and impacts. And here it's a dissemination and exploitation plan. And last but not least, um, the quality and efficiency of the implementation. So it's where applicants will have to describe the work plan, uh, present their work packages, their deliverables, their milestones, and so on and so forth. And the second section is about the quality of the consortium and the role of each participant. So here, uh, the role of each participant needs to be de described as well as why all those participants together are making an interesting consortium to uh, implement the project. These are the evaluation criteria uh, for the CSAs. That's basically the same, so I will not enter into the details. The evaluation process, this is similar as um, under Horizon 2020. Proposals will be assessed by external experts that will first evaluate individually the proposals and then they will discuss in a consensus group. Then there will be a panel review to harmonize the scores and then the finalization, the commission uh, will uh, put together a final ranking list. This is about scoring thresholds and weighting. I will not enter into details because we don't have much time and this is uh, basically the same as under Horizon 2020. So. If you want to, to have a look at the slide afterwards, uh, you can. Novelty regarding Horizon Europe is uh, what we call the right to react. It's a pilot. It's implementing a really limited number of uh, Horizon Europe topics for the moment. And the objective is to increase the transparency and correct any factual errors that the expert could uh, make at an early stage. So for topics in which this is uh, applied, up, um, applicants will receive just after the individual evaluation of the expert, what is the feedback of the expert and they will be able to send their reaction to correct any mistakes that could uh, have happened. So we are piloting that uh, now, it will be evaluated and assessed and if this pilot is successful, it might be uh, implemented in more uh, topics under Horizon Europe. We also have a pilot on blind evaluation or anonymized evaluation, but this has not been tested yet. So I will not enter into details. If you are interested, we, we can discuss it during the Q&A. And finally, my uh, last two slides, ethic review and security scrutiny. So in uh, Horizon Europe, uh, as under Horizon 2020, there is an ethic review. So all proposals that are uh, above the threshold uh, and considered for funding will undergo this ethic review on the basis of the assessment that was um, provided by applicants. And um, the experts will screen uh, the proposals to see if there is any serious uh, or complex ethic issue. And in under Horizon Europe, we will really focus on the complex and serious cases. And if experts flag this kind of complex and serious uh, issues, there will be an ethics assessment that can lead to some ethics requirements in funded projects. Uh, here again, there is plenty of material available about the ethic review on the funding and third portal. So if you want more information, uh, you will be able to find it. So I can also indicate to you where, where to find it. And finally, the security scrutiny. This is something new in Horizon Europe, and it's a bit the same principle as the ethics review. Um, there will be um, it's uh, only uh, applying for the proposals that are considering for, for funding. There is a self-assessment here again in the proposal, whether uh, the proposal has um, some security issues. There will be a pre-screening by qualified staff to identify if indeed there is 
security issues or not. And if um, if there is indeed serious security issue, the proposal will be um, assessed by national experts on security. And it may uh, um, it may result in some security requirements following this uh, this assessments. I'm not entering more in detail because well the time is running. And one final point, uh, you know that the Commission is always looking for uh, new experts, and I would encourage you to encourage uh, researchers you are in or other other applicants people interested in the program that you are in contact with to apply to become uh, an expert to evaluate the horizon europe proposal because for we really believe that the best way to learn how to write a successful proposal is also to jump on the other side and to participate uh, to some evaluation so we have a call um, for experts that is permanently open it is accessible in the funding and tender pro tenders portal and there's a work as an expert and um, yeah you can advise and make a bit of publicity for for this uh, for this page if you if you wish to and it's also there if you are interested that you can access um, the materials that we are using to brief experts so that can be also an interesting document to to look at and i think with this i'm uh, over with the presentation. I will okay. stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much. Uh, to... yep. Okay, normally it stopped. Yes, yes, it stopped. Um, so can you hear me? Yes. So we have a couple of questions for you. And by far the most popular out of all of them is uh, the following. The online manual says, limit the number of deliverables to maximum 10 to 15 for the entire product. And the person asks if this is only a recommendation or if it's obligatory. So it's a, of course only a recommendation. And let me explain to you why the online manual is written that way. Uh, under Horizon 2020, we had an online manual that was called the Horizon 2020 online manual. But uh, with this new framework, um, multi-annual multi financial framework, and you may have noticed that way more programs, EU-funded programs, are using the funding and tenders portal, and not only Horizon. It means that some of these guidance documents have become corporate. They are have to work for all the EU-funded programs. And Horizon Europe is a bit of a specific animal if we, we compare it to the majority of EU-funded programs, because we have, in average, bigger projects with more participants, bigger budget. So this has been written in the in the online manual as a recommendation that should be an average for all EU programs. And we know that for Horizon Europe, we have sometimes really big project, long project with a big consortium and 15 deliverables will not be enough. So this is only a recommendation. Of course, an application will not be rejected because it has more than 15 deliverables. What is also worth to keep in mind is that under Horizon Europe, we want also to limit the deliverables to really the essential um, outputs of the action. We don't want to have thousands of deliverables neither, but of course it's not limited to, to 15. And the same applies to work packages, because in the online manual, it is also said that in average should be, I think it's five to six work packages in a proposal. Same logic applies here. It can be more for Horizon Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Benedict. And uh, yes, I think you uh, you've answered at the same time on the, the next question, which was uh, if it was also applicable to RIA and uh, ER and to CSA, but I think it has disappeared in the meantime. So it's only a recommendation. That's the, yes, the key message. That's the key message. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, so a, a question that has been asked several times also is how to define deliverables and milestones in a project. For example, if uh, each workshop the project organizes a milestone itself or the task uh, workshop organization. So it's a little bit the hierarchy of the things. So yep. what would you suggest actually? Well, here it's it's a bit of the same logic. So milestone and deliverables uh, need to be really uh, 
essential uh, outcomes or essential moment of the of the project like we don't need 10,000 of deliverables and we don't need 10,000 of um, of milestones they need to be the really uh, for the milestones a really key moment of the project the moment that will like you will have reached something or the progression towards something has been achieved this is a milestone same for the deliverables it needs to be uh, key outputs we don't want, I don't know, if you have a project that is organizing a lot of conferences, we don't want to have, for example, I don't know, a report on each conference as a deliverable because it's giving a lot of work to the project. It's also giving work to uh, to the commission services and this can be addressed in periodic reporting. We don't necessarily need a report, a special deliverable for that. Then, of course, if one project has as main objective organize a super big conference with an international in an international framework, and this is the key activity, of course, this will deserve a deliverable. That really depends on the, the nature of the project and um, and what are the, the objectives. But yeah, keep in mind that don't multiply deliverables. That's giving you too much work and that's not what should be the main focus of the project. It's, making more sense to focus on the really scientific, technical coordination support activities of your project. Thank you very much, uh, Benedict. There is a, I'm going to combine two questions actually that are related and it's on the gender equality plans. And the question is for the 2021 calls uh, with the contracts to be signed in 2022. Is it a must to have this plan for public entities as well? And on a related note, how do you define a public entity in this context? So the uh, question of the since when, from when this uh, requirement is applicable is for all the calls that have a deadline in 2022. So if the deadline of your call is 2022, even if it opened in 2021, you need to have it. But if uh, you submitted your proposal, the call closure is, I don't know, in December 2021. So, of course, you will not sign the grant in 2021, but in 2022, you don't need to have it because the call closure was in 2021. And then the definition of public bodies, I don't want to say stupid things. This is the traditional definition of uh, legal entities we have when it is validated in the validation system. So I'm sure you can find the definition on the um, either on the online manual or on the IT how to guide, but I don't want to, to say something stupid now. <laughs> and um, as you can expect, there, there is a question on the researchers table, but if you can just confirm that uh, you must be aware that there is a technical bug actually in the system, so you need to fill in something so to be able to submit your proposals. Yeah, we are aware of that. Okay. So that's a, indeed a short comment because like if you don't have researcher like you don't need to to fill this table but we are aware that there is a there is a bug and that normally um, the thing is that normally in this table nothing is mandatory but if um, if applicants enter a researcher we ask uh, the system to work in such a way that they always need to fill an email address for this researcher. And this is because at the really beginning of the program, a lot of people just put it like, we are going to recruit a PhD student to work on this. And this was not useful because we use this for monitoring purpose of real people and not potential PhD student to be registered. So now we ask to have this field mandatory, but now we have an IT bug that it is requiring it, even if we don't have a researcher. So that doesn't make any sense. I agree with you. And our colleagues from the IT services are, um, are working on it to, to fix it as soon as possible. OK, great. Thank you. And um, just still relating to, to the templates, uh, someone is asking, uh, compared to the Horizon 2020 template, uh, part B, there was a subsection to describe the partners in the uh, in the consortium. And um, the question is, this is gone now in the Horizon Europe template. So just can can you confirm where to fill in the, the partners and, and describe 
Yeah. So um, it's true that under Horizon 2020, we had this section four and section five that were not used uh, counting the page limits. So people could uh, add a lot of information about the partners. And often uh, there was a small sections where people were putting small CVs or small biography of the, the key people to be involved in the in the program. We don't have the, this possibility any longer to upload this section four, but um, the um, partners and um, who they are, what they are going to do in the proposals, this need to be described under the, the section three, everything related to uh, the description of the consortium and the, and the partners. Great. So thank you. Thank you very much, Benedicta. I see that we are a bit over time and we've promised also the speakers. And uh, I've, I've been too long. <laughs> No, not at all. Edna. So we're really grateful for for all uh, your your information. Uh, actually, we'll try to to address the other questions also tomorrow because some of them are relevant also for uh, the the other parts um, of of the proposal template. Um, but I, I will have a look at the slider questions, and if I see that some interesting and important questions are there. Uh, we can also think about making more frequently asked questions about uh, about the submission and the evaluation and publish them in the portal. So, um, as you are NCPs and are well aware of what people is asking, it's uh, it's also super interest instructive for for me and for my colleagues. That's really great if we can proceed like that. So, um, so then I suggest to close the this part of the the session now and then to have a break and restart at 4.15. So, uh, enjoy your coffee break and Benedict, thank you again. Uh, Caroline, we see you. Thank you to all of you. Thank you.
So, hello everyone. Welcome back. It's 4.15 and we're back from our break. I hope everyone's back with us. Um, so, uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to move on to the next section of, of this um, training with uh, Alexandra Almeida, who's uh, here uh, to present to us as a Horizon 2020 project beneficiary of SME LOBA, uh, his experience as a beneficiary, as an applicant, uh, the impact section of the application form. So Alexandre is the director of the European Projects Department at SLOBA, and he has more than 10 years of experience in the coordination of European projects. Uh, he's also participated in more than 25 projects and collaborated on hundreds of proposals. And so his practical experience here will be um, very useful to all of us. And Alexandre, if you can turn on, turn on your camera. Uh, well, uh, uh, when I when I share the screen, I cannot uh, turn the camera on. I don't know okay, why. Okay, well, <laughs> we'll have to listen uh, to you. Yeah, I don't know, speech. but uh, it uh, deactivates the camera. So okay, well, but, well, we'll continue like this then. So the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. So good afternoon to to everyone. So as was said, we just uh, hear a declaration of interest. I represent a, a private company. We we don't represent the European Commission. So and what we bring here today is is our experience uh, from the involvement in uh, hundreds of proposals in Horizon 2020. And now we already participated in around 30. We are participating in around 30 proposals for for Horizon Europe, and we are acquiring this uh, this knowledge. It's always difficult to to go from one program to another with the differences, but um, we are all learning. And this is the first round of proposal. We still don't have uh, like a, a, a feedback from what we what we are doing, but I think we are going on the on the on the right way um, just to start and uh, as a general uh, remark uh, and also because we are talking about the impact and the in, in inside the impact we are talking about dissemination and communication we we need to follow when we are writing the, this uh, section and the proposal uh, as a whole we need to follow uh, uh, the principles of uh, good communication because with what we are doing is we are communicating our intentions what we want to do to the evaluators to the european commission so we need to 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 present a proposal that is complete we we already talked during this session uh, a lot about the, the template it's not mandatory but well it's it's what is recommended so at the end it's almost uh, mandatory so we need to present a, a complete proposal following this uh, this template we need to be concise and i saw already some questions on on slido about this that is uh, not enough pages etc but these these are the rules so we need to be uh, very concise we need to use common sense when when we are explaining what we want to do we will not say that uh, we will find the cure for cancer with a 1 million uh, project it's not uh, it's not uh, possible and, and so we need to be uh, use the common sense in what we we write and what we define we need to be clear as you may know uh, um, the evaluators they don't have uh, so much time to evaluate the the proposals so a clear language a clear proposal will help them to understand and to benefit our our proposal we need to be coherent during the process of writing a proposal we are going back and forward we have a, a lot of contributions from partners we change things we need to to bear in mind that if we change the deliverable for instance in a work package we need to change this also also in the table of deliverables or 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 or, or vice versa so we need to be very careful with this because in the, in the in the situation that we are uh, tied with another proposal to be uh, financed this could make the the difference and then with all this we can also be creative so we have a template we have rules but we can be can have some some creativity in the proposal using uh, schemes, uh, infographics, uh, uh, pictures that can better uh, describe what we want uh, to do. Going to the to the to the impact session. Uh, 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 so the impact session is split in, in three in three parts, um, and it's like the, this picture represents it's it's a it's a jigsaw all all the parts needs to to fit perfectly with each other they are uh, related and 
uh, we need always to to have in mind this coherence, as I said before. Um, it's a lot of things that are asked <laughs> uh, from the template, and so we have this dilemma: how can we write? everything in 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 nine pages being that one of the pages it's it's uh, almost uh, mandatory as as said before that is the section 2.3 so uh, it's it's complicated uh, uh, it's it's not easy to to condense everything in in the in the, in nine pages and this is a, a dilemma what can be uh, taken out what should really be in the in the proposal and i think my my intention in this uh, presentation is is that to 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 highlight what is more uh, important um, this stays here for for uh, for um, future reading because it was already uh, uh, um, presented before but uh, um, we we need what is what is uh, important in the impact is the, the the credibility of the pathways that we are uh, describing uh, also that the impact that the project have uh, behind be, behind the, beyond the, the what is stated in the topic uh, societal uh, financial business impact uh, environmental etc and this everything on the impact must be sustained by a suitable and with high quality um, uh, plan for for uh, uh, maximizing the, the these outcomes through dissemination, exploitation, and communication uh, um, activities. I, I will say, and we saw that Horizon Europe is impact-oriented, so I will say that uh, um, most probably this is the, 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 the most important part of, uh, of, the, of the proposals. Um, if we look to like uh, upstream, downstream approach, uh, um, we have uh, uh, we need to avoid this error of thinking that uh, the impact are, are is the 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 results of, of the project that it's not it's what we do with that results and the impact that we have in the, in the in the scientific community in the European citizens in the European economy in in our institution particularly so we need this is what we need to to define um, and the, Upstream, downstream, we can see that, that uh, we have the project objectives that are the, the, the technological and commercial goals. We then the activities that we define with the work plan, with the work packages, tasks, subtasks, deliverables, milestones. We have the results, KPIs, not confusing with the key, AP, key IPs that we, <laughs> we talked before. Uh, and this then will lead to the impacts internal for each ap applicant, what they do with this uh, with these results, but also, of course, the external the impacts on on the society. Um, and to consider the impacts, we need uh, again from top down approach. We we have the legal the objectives and the key IPs, the, the, the key impact pathways. We have the strategy and the, and the policies defined by the European Commission, and then we have the work program. Uh, and we have impact in the destinations and in the topics, and then we have impact our uh, uh, results. As said before, uh, do not force. We don't. We don't need to have impact in in in, uh, in all of this. We need to be uh, honest and uh, list and detail the impacts where uh, we 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 have them. Don't think on having impacts in in all in all all the key impact pathways, for instance, um, and. This is a, a mistake that we see sometimes. That is, do not limit the the impact only to the to the to the expected impacts published in the call. We need to touch all these uh, uh, levels of of impact. Um, again, just for reference, we have uh, the key impact pathways, the nine key impact pathways that are divided in, in scientific impact, societal impact, and economic or uh, technological impact. If we have impact on these nine uh, items, we should describe them. Um, going a, a little bit now to the, to the section 2.2, of the impact, uh, uh, dissemination and communication. 
um, this is a, a very famous uh, section, and there is always, especially, and and the, you as NCP, and my I, my intention with this presentation is that you can use this information to support uh, your let's put it between commas, your clients, uh, and um, uh, especially the ones that are new coming to the, to the, to the, um, to the program. That, and it, there is always this doubt, what is dissemination, what is communication, why the European Commission defines this. And dissemination, it's, it's make the, uh, making the results public to peers, but not only. It's also for public authorities, industry, policymakers, civil society organizations, citizens, everyone that uh, may benefit with the, with the projects. And how? By publishing the results in magazines, in conferences, in databases. And this starts when we start to have results of the projects. And the objective, it's, it's very clear. It's a macro maximize impact, it's to share with peers and it's to improve the, the, the state of the art. If we share our, our uh, research with, with, with our peers, they will have a basis to improve the state of the art and to work on, on our work. Uh, and then the communication. The communication starts to the, uh, from, fr from the beginning of the project until the end of the project. And the objective is to inform about the activities and the, the results of our projects to multiple audiences. Citizens could be the main target, but uh, we can also include the, 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 um, the industry, the public authorities, whoever may be interested in our, in our project. But we need, what we need to highlight in the communication is the importance of the European collaboration. And also we need to show to the public, to all of us, because we are all paying these projects with our taxes, that the public money is being well uh, spent. Uh, and we always used to say this, this could be in a project, the most uh, transversal uh, activity that is su a successful communication and dissemination of the project needs to involve all partners. Um, they need to work together to achieve uh, better results. So, in practice, what, what is our suggestion for uh, uh, the structure of the, the, the impact session? This, as I said, is, 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 um, is a suggestion. Um, we will not have time to touch all the points. You will, keep, you will, be, you will have my contact uh, if you want to have more details. So our suggestion is 2.1, as it is on the template, project pathways toward the, towards impact, and we split between outcomes specifying in the, in the topic and wider impacts in the destination and work program. On this, we need to have the scale and significance of the project contribution as requested. Then we have a uh, 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 section point three that is the key indicators, pathways, and other impacts. So we touch the scientific, the societal, and the economic impacts. But then we can, we can have others. We can have uh, the Green Deal uh, the, um, priorities, the the the. Um, the, the SDG priorities, etc. Whatever your your um, your um, uh, project touch. For instance, if you have, uh, if it's very important uh, some impact in the environment, it should be stated here. And then potential barriers to this uh, to to the to uh, to the achievement of these uh, impacts. Um, I have here a table with the how. It's an example how the key, the key uh, in, um, impact pathways can be described. So what is the expected result in which work package, then the scale, the significance, and the target group. Um, going to the section uh, 2.2. Again, so many things for, for, uh, <laughs> for nine pages, but don't forget, uh, draft dissemination and communication, uh, dissemination and exploitation plan, including communication activities, it's mandatory. So we need to have this. And our suggestion is, okay, we have a, 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 um, a small text just um, talking about the creation of the identity of the project. This we keep outside of this plan, but then in the plan, we need to have the, the to whom, how, when, what, all these questions are 
describe it here. So um, the, the things that I put on green, the, I will show some examples of how, how we can, uh, we can um, write them. But uh, I want to highlight here one that is the exploitation booster materials. It's something that we created. It comes from the Horizon 2020 and we had good results. We changed the name here um, to be more exploitation related. But in practice is what uh, uh, information that we can, ex actionable knowledge, knowledge that we can extract from the project. Sometimes we have a deliverable, it's a very useful deliverable, but with 150 pages or 200 pages, that is very difficult to, to, to read. What we do is we can create a, a fact sheet fact sheet or an infographic or a policy brief that will present this um, this result in a more friendly way let's say um, then of course we we need to have the 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 kpis uh, the evaluation criteria um, communication exploitation and the timeline how this this makes part of a draft uh, uh, plan for dissemination and exploitation we need to have a, a timeline we also include the management of intellectual property rights and the, the 2.3 that is the, the new table that as was said before it's not uh, mandatory but well, we need to, to, to put it there. Uh, it, it will, it, we will be in a, a different level if we don't show it, uh, if compared with the others that, that show it. Uh, an example of a table that we can uh, use for the target groups, it's a way also to condense information. So we have a target group, we have a dissemination objectives and a core message, we, and we have the channels and tool. Here we put uh, already the whom, the 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 what and the, the how at the same time uh, we this is an example of what could be uh, the exploitation booster materials so uh, uh, ordered by month we have from month one the creation of the entity then we create a we create a splash page then we launch the website and social media and in the middle if you saw in blue there are the specific uh, uh, um, exploitation booster materials, fact sheets, infographics, banners, videos, posters, whatever it makes easier for us to present our, the results of the project. Uh, and this is a, an example of the key performance indicators, just an example, but it should follow this approach. Website, what is the metric that we are using? and we used to do this and, and it works very well. That is, um, what, what are the, the key performance indicators that we expect at in this case for a project of 36, 36 months that we expect at the middle of the project? In this case, an example, um, 1,500 visits at month 18 and again, more 1,500 visits uh, at, at the second uh, year at second half of the project. So this is just an example, but a recommendation is to do this split instead of putting at, at the end of the project, we want to have uh, uh, 10,000 visitors to the website. We can split it by period. It's it's easier and also easier to, to manage um, at, uh, at the end of, if the project uh, is approved. Um, and, uh, and that's it. I, I forgot one thing here, but I have, one minute just to, to talk about the, the deliverables. So it's mandatory to have the deliverable, the plan for dissemination and exploitation, including communication activities, the extended version. It's mandatory until month six of the project. We need to put it. And then we used to put um, uh, yearly uh, deliverable to, uh, to report about the communication activities. This and updated plan, because when you analyze what you did, when you have a report on the communication activities, you can understand if you need to do adjustments to this uh, initial plan, and for sure that you will need to do it. Uh, and that's it for now. So this is my, my contact, my email, if you need uh, clarifications. And now I'm open for, uh, for questions. Thank you very much, Alexandre, for all, sharing all your experience and these very interesting examples, um, because it's, it's, it's really nice to, to share actually some examples. Uh, here the participants ask for minimum requirements and etc. And the big challenge seems to be still to cope with the limited number of pages. So I thank you 
uh, thank you for sharing the some tips, you know, to cope with these limitations and and structure the information. That's the most that is the most important, just to uh, to make the, all the paths very clear. Um, there is a question that summarizes very well, since we are all here NCPs uh, in the audience. So, what would be your expectations? from your NCP as, as, as a client, as an applicant? Well, normally uh, um, it's true and probably the, the Portuguese NCP is here. We don't, we don't do that a lot when we are the coordinators, but I, uh, we have now at least three proposals that we are participating that the coordinator asks for a revision of the proposal to the NCP. So uh, they are sending the proposal to get comments, uh, practical, practical comments, as almost uh, uh, an evaluation. Of course, the NCP doesn't need to know technically what we are doing, uh, but um, I think this is working fine in these proposals that we are uh, uh, working. So asking the NCP to review the proposal and give us uh, inputs on what we, we are doing, I think it's a, it's a good uh, service. <laughs> Great. Um, thank, I, I think, uh, Caroline, did you spot any other question we can ask to uh, Alexandre before he leaves? Uh, no, I was just going to say, I think this is a great message to the Portuguese NCPs in the audience to uh, contact Loba and, and set up a collaboration. <laughs> thank you. Um, and, and thank I you very say, much. Yeah, and um, I, I see that Benedict Charbonnel is still uh, with us, and I hope she can also take with her the remaining questions on the Slido. Um, and I'm sure they will also feed the frequently asked questions um, on, on the portal. Um, and so now, Alexandre, again, thank you very much. Uh, I'm now pleased to introduce the next and last speaker. Uh, Mechtil Bauman, um, who is a, a, an independent expert for the European Commission. Uh, she's um, a political scientist from Berlin in Germany, and uh, she has been working as a European project coordinator and an evaluator for more than, for more than 20 years. And um, she's been assisting the European Commission in assessing funding proposals under FP7 already and Horizon 2020 for about 10 years. So, uh, Martin, we, we're looking forward to hear from your experience as an evaluator. So the floor is yours. OK, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me and thank you to uh, the 174 participants that are still with us. I think that's great. Um, you show great disciplines and I hope I won't disappoint me, uh, disappoint you, sorry. Yeah, um, as I have been kindly introduced, I am here to speak as you in my um, role as evaluator. I have been evaluating lots of proposals, not only Horizon 2020, but also from other programs. And uh, in the meantime, I have also started giving courses on how to write um, and create impact-driven European projects. And I advise researchers on um, creating impact-driven research projects so what I will present to you today is practically my findings and observations from both kinds of activities, which are quite interlinked. So uh, we're talking about proposals and what are common fails or mistakes that applicants might do? Are there similarities that I have observed while um, evaluating? Or um, are there specific problems that applicants are regularly confronted with. And um, yeah, the question is, how can we help the beginners to become winners? And uh, this is what I want to share with you today. And I'm trying to get the screen sharing on. I have highlighted three points, three major obstacles or problems that I have observed so far. One is linked to the excellence part. I know we talk about impact, but I'd like to highlight this. And two problems that are about um, the impact section. Okay, let me start with the excellence part. 
the most and yeah most evident and strongest problem that I observe is that very often the proposals don't cover what is requested in the call text. Uh, I'm so simple. sorry to, to interrupt, mm -hmm. but if you've shared your screen, we don't see it. Uh, we ha I haven't shared yet. Okay, okay, no worries. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, the proposals um, don't cover sufficiently what is uh, requested in the call text. And what um, applicants then receive in their evaluation report sounds something like this. And now I'm starting my screen sharing, I hope. Okay. Um, can you see my screen now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Can. Great. So uh, the feedback that applicants get is typically something like this: the objectives are explained in some detail, some are clearly relevant to the overall objectives of the call. However, this is always the kill <laughs> killing phrase. However, many are instead reflections of the proposed research activities and do not adequately relate to the objectives of the call topic. So we try to formulate it in polite terms that this is real bad assessment. And it says, in other words, the proposal does not match the call. Now, why is this? I have uh, several explanations for this, and I will present you one, uh, which I call uh, the perception bias. Sorry. The perception bias means that um, applicants or the coordinator reads the call text and perceives something different that was meant by the European Commission. Now, let, let me give you an example. I have observed very often um, that uh, a coordinator cross reads the call text. And then there are one or two key words that um, catch his eye. And um, I tried to symbolize this in an image. I'm a very visual person. So let's imagine this boat here on top of the screen. This boat imagines the keyword. So a coordinator or someone, a researcher, reads the call text. There is this one keyword which pops up, and immediately um, they think, oh, great. This is my topic. I have been researching it for ages. And uh, we could um, resubmit the project proposal that was rejected last year by our national fund. Or this would greatly benefit my career. And because in his mind, there is a certain picture, something like this, which um, is the perception of the reader or the coordinator in this case. The problem is that in some cases, sometimes in many cases, the perception is not necessarily what is written and expressed in the call text. So it, very often it's that the commission, when formulating the work program, meant something different. And this is um, where we have this mismatch, uh, two different perceptions of, um, of one, one notion. And um, I'll try to deactivate my camera. Uh, so we have a completely different, different perception. And as a consequence, the coordinators and the applicants elaborate a research design which does not match the requirements in the call text. So what can we do? How can we help applicants um, avoid this perception bias? Mm, the first thing is we need to really advise them to thoroughly analyze the call text, not just cross-read it, but really thoroughly analyze it word by word. And we need to help them translate the Brussels speech into their context. Yeah, not everyone is familiar with the formulations and the wordings uh, that is used, I call it in the bubbles, in the Brussels bubbles. Uh, for some researchers' ears, this is really foreign language, so we need to translate it somehow. 
And then we, yeah, we need to help them create a research design that really matches all the requirements of the call. Um, and I, for instance, for this purpose, I have um, developed uh, some sort of uh, an approach. Show you. Um, I call it a three steps check. It's an approach helping applicants to really get all the criteria which are formulated in the call and how they can respond to them in a way um, that uh, the Commission expects. Okay, um, let's move on to impact. Um, there I want to highlight one general thing and then um, go into more depth. Uh, what we observe very often when evaluating proposals is that the impact section is described in rather vague and general terms. And I think this is, has to do with that many researchers that I have met, they dislike this part. Impact is the part that really, it's the most hated by all the researchers. Um, they call it, some call it impact blah blah or the pros. Uh, in other words, a collection of superfluous words which dips, deprives them of important space. They would rather have to explain their research design. And I think this is one reason why very often researchers are rather reluctant and have some sort of inner resistance um, to spend time and energy on this part, which is fatal because we know how, how much uh, it is evaluated and how much scoring goes to this part. So um, as a result, what we can see as evaluators is the following. The feedback that um, applicants will get for a vague um, impact plan is something like this. The dissemination plan is rather generic, particularly with respect to community building and is not adequately focused on the target groups. So we here we come to one of the major parts of impact, which is dissemination and communication. And just in the previous um, input, we have heard how much emphasis they put on this part. And obviously they do it the right way because they have won subsequently um, these calls. It is absolutely important for a good impact, not only to describe the expected impacts, but also to provide convincing methods and approaches how to maximize this impact. And um, another, so I'm getting out of this, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and why is this um, communication and dissemination plan sometimes, yeah, let's say, neglected? I think one reason is that, uh, for instance, most of our researchers are not, yeah, sometimes not fully aware of the importance and the potential of these communication and dissemination measures. For them, it's something on top, uh, a burden. And what we have observed quite regularly is that they put in uh, a standard copy-paste text, which is provided by the central funding department of the university. This is not good. Because as an evaluator, you see, you, you can recognize standard measures. And you, you ask yourself, are these measures really apt to achieve an impact or yeah, to help the, the project to really unfold this great impact with the help of the results? So this is a very important point. Now I come to the last point, impact under Horizon Europe. Um, I really appreciate this very structured approach which, ha which has been used now under Horizon Europe. And um, I really also appreciate 
the, the Commission's um, attempt to make this inner logic of the Horizon Europe programming much clearer. I think it has become more transparent to see, okay, these are the outputs, outcomes, impacts, and um, what is uh, expected from the projects, and how does it fit into the overall program logic. And what is also actually beneficial is this new proposal template explaining in detail what applicants are expected to write under the different impact sections. However, <laughs> I am afraid to say this. Those researchers that I have met so far and with whom I have discussed the new Horizon Europe templates and requirements they are even more confused than they were before. Um, they, they really don't, uh, they're getting lost between the key impact pathways and the key strategic orientations and the impact areas and the missions. And uh, they don't really know how to handle all these different concepts. Um, and uh, it's not clear to them if this is something um, if this is part of the concept or if this is something on top. Um, and I'm uh, showing you some, um, some quotes uh, from, from applicants, what uh, the discussions look like. If I change the... Sorry, can you hear this? Research design, do I have to change the yes. things yes. as well? I'm struggling with the key impact pathways. Must I address them all? I've got another question. How should I fill in that impact table? Yes, well, these are typical questions that we discuss. And um, as I said, for many, it's not clear how to integrate this into the whole research design. And yeah. How can we um, support applicants? Um, I think first thing is to really raise their awareness about the communication and dissemination measures and that it's really important to develop targeted measures and provide indicators, just like we have heard before. The second and much more challenging task is to familiarize them with this program logic or the intervention logic, lock frame, call it whatever you like. Um, this very structured approach, which, uh, lie, which makes the basis of Horizon Europe programming and subsequently of the projects and their predefined structure. And this is something that we need to really trans help translate uh, to, to the applicants because I think that is absolutely not clear and this is the most difficult job. Yeah, and um, I developed an approach to help applicants better understand this and better get into this uh, logic, but um, I will stop here and maybe give you one last slide share and show you a one minute video that I shot to, yeah, for, for my clients to better understand what are the difference between communication, dissemination and exploitation, because this uh, usually leads to much confusion.
yeah, thank you very much for watching this and I'm happy to get your questions. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your uh, great presentation. It was really, really nice. Um, we haven't received uh, any questions so far. I think maybe our participants are, are a bit uh, discouraged by the time, but it would be great uh, maybe, uh, you know, if they can contact you. Um, I just want to share with you a comment that we did receive that says Dr. Bowman is a great speaker. Thank you for inviting her. <laughs> so I wanted to share that with you and uh, I also agree. Thank you for coming and sharing your wisdom with us. Yeah, I can quickly, uh, I forgot to show my contact details in case anyone wants to contact me afterwards. Yeah, but um, keep on talking, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, no, thank you very much for giving us the details. Yes, and, and for those of you, yes, who are uh, still with us tomorrow, we wish you, yes, a good rest tonight. And uh, of course, we hope to, to see you also tomorrow, same time, same. Uh, you've received a, a specific link for tomorrow. It will be the same uh, address for Slido. Uh, don't forget to give us our uh, your feedback. Uh, I see some comments in the chat, but uh, thank you to fill in the form. It's very important for us and the commission, and I'm sure the speakers also will appreciate to, to, to get your, your feedback. So if we have, we can convey them um, your messages, it would be very appreciated. So thank you again. Thank you uh, so much, Mechtil, for uh, your inspiring messages, and uh, I hope we can all um yes go out of the session with with these key messages and this enthusiasm uh, for uh, taking all the challenges that are still ahead of us uh for um, yes until the end of the program and probably the next one thanks to all, all, also alexandre and benedict who's still with us um it's been a pleasure to be with you this afternoon and thank you of course all the participants today uh see you tomorrow Thank you very much to everyone. See you tomorrow. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.